All right. So um, as we continue to allow people to come in, I want to get started. So welcome everyone to our quarterly suicide prevention coalition meeting for Riverside County. My name is Diana Gutierrez. I am the prevention and early intervention manager here at Riverside University Health Systems Behavioral Health Department. And I am also co-leads for our Riverside County Suicide Prevention Coalition. And uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Ampion. I am with the Riverside University Health System Public Health Department. I am a program director with our Injury Prevention Services Branch. And I have uh, the wonderful pleasure of acting as co-chair of the Suicide Prevention Coalition. So thank you all for joining us today. Hey, so just to kind of orient you to how we'll spend our time together today, quick agenda. We are going to be covering all things older adults and suicide prevention today. So we have a, it's a little bit different than our typical setup. So we wanted to give as much time as possible to, um, we have the fortune of having um, Dr. Patrick Arbor with us today. So we want to give him as much time as possible to share information with us. Uh, before he has a chance to speak, we're going to talk a little bit about some local Riverside County data as it applies to older adults and suicide. And then at the end of our time, we'll get a, hear a little bit about resources um, and then, uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay, so as people are trickling in, let's just dive in. All right, thanks, Diana. So to get us started in our presentation, uh, we have Jocelyn Franco, who's one of our co-chairs from the Measuring and Sharing Outcomes Subcommittee. Uh, Jocelyn will be sharing our Riverside can uh, County data, looking at suicide, uh, specifically in our older adults. Uh, so Jocelyn, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hi, good morning. Yes, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in. So when we're looking at suicide data specific for our Riverside County population, we can see that our older adults, the 60 years and up, are consistently impacted by suicide at a much higher percentage versus our youth population. When we take a look at our rates per 100,000 population, we see that our older adults do have the highest rate as well. Um, and for many years, most of the suicide prevention emphasis has been on youth and young adults. However, the data does tell us that middle-aged and older adults die by suicide at higher rates and in larger numbers than youth. As the population ages, suicide may continue to increase unless prevention and intervention programs are implemented. Next slide. Okay. So now we're gonna break it down even further and we're gonna look at suicide um, compared among more condensed age groups. So within, so we see that adults 80 years <clears throat> and up experience the higher, the highest percentage of death by suicide, but it is closely followed by our 60 to 40 to 60 to 64 year age group. Uh, for many years, the highest rates increased with age across the lifespan so that people in their 80s had higher rates of suicide death than those in their 70s, which were higher than in their 60s and so on. However, in the past decade, the rate and number of suicides among adults aged 35 to 64 increased by almost one third nationally, which is similar to what we have experienced in Riverside County. Some risk factors increase with age, including the onset of late life depression, increased social isolation as older people lose family members and friends to death, and as their mobility becomes more limited, including increased pain and health problems and fear of prolonged illness and or disabilities. Next slide. So looking at suicide deaths by gender and race ethnicity gives us another perspective. Men consistently die by suicide at greater percentage versus women. Often older adults may have access to lethal means, including firearms and medications, and they tend to plan their deaths in advance rather than act impulsively. Additionally, taking a look at suicide by race ethnicity shows us that white whites are the highest percentage dying by suicide. So when we layer this information, it highlights the need to target older adult white males in suicide prevention efforts. Traditionally, men have not been encouraged or empowered to engage in help seeking behaviors, which may play a large part in why they are impacted so greatly by suicide and is one way we can support this population. Also note that um, even though 2021 data is provisional, there is a jump in the suicide deaths in Hispanic 
and our Asian Pacific Islander populations. Okay. Next slide. So there is a breakdown that looks at veteran status, and it could be that we see more veterans in this population due to their historical participation in previous wars. Not necessarily that because they are veterans that they are more at risk for suicide. There could be more contributing factors for this population that we can look at. The re-traumatizing experience of losing their family and friends as they also age feeling more isolated. The older adult population typically may have more access to more deadly means, so firearms. The means for this age cohort, how it compares to other age cohorts, we tend to see in younger age groups, um, more younger age groups, uh, we tend to see more hanging and poisoning um, versus uh, older adults that we do see double the percent in firearm use. Typically, we see more males who use firearms as a means and females who use hanging or self-poisoning. Okay, so when we're looking at suicide attempts in Riverside County, older adults do have a lower attempt rate. However, this could be because there is a higher completion rate. So we also see more attempts in the younger side of the older adult, the 60 to 69 range. We can see that in this population, more live transitions that could be cont contributors, loss of spouse, significant other, retirement, changes in income, chronic illness that impacts quality of life. It could be that as it tapers off, this is due to a small population size in those age groups as older adults get older. Next slide. Okay, and looking at um, sex, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, we see that attempts among females are higher while we, earlier we saw that completion rates were higher among males. Males also tend to use more deadly means, which would make it more unlikely for them to survive an attempt. And we also see that uh, whites continue to have higher rates of suicide attempts. Terrific. Thank you, Jocelyn. Really appreciate having kind of that overview of what some local data looks like here in Riverside County. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Arbor, who is the founder of the Friendship Line and the director of the Center of Elderly Prevention and Grief-Related Services, both programs at the Institute on Aging in San Francisco. Dr. Arbor conducts workshops and presents lectures, both locally and nationally, and is the author of numerous articles and book chapters on a variety of age-related topics. He also has been a senior lecturer at Notre Dame de Namur University in Belmont, California, an occasional lecturer in the School of Social Welfare at the University of California, Berkeley, and an adjunct faculty member at the Wright Institute. Dr. Arbor is the recipient of several awards, including the 2013 Mental Health and Aging Award presented by the American Society on Aging, a silver medalist for public service sponsored by the Jefferson Award Regional Committee, and the 2016 Norma Satin Community Service Innovation Award for his commitment to human rights and community living. Please help me welcome Dr. Patrick Arbor. Thank you very much, um, Diana, and I'm very honored to uh, participate uh, in this program today. And uh, Mindy's gonna be helping me with the, with the slides. And I just wanted to acknowledge Jocelyn's presentation because I think that is, um, you know, really, really helpful information, you know, as you look at uh, older people in your region. Um, I'm going to be giving an overview of uh, issues related to um, older adults and suicide prevention. And I have a lot of slides, you know, because the topic really um, is very rich with information. And uh, although we're not going to spend a lot of time on every slide, I wanted you to have that information available to you. Uh, next slide, Mindy. Uh, so as um, Diana was saying, um, back in the early 70s, I began my career in the field of aging. So as we enter um, uh, 2022, uh, Friendship Line is going to be 49 years old. And so uh, we began in 1973. 
with the friendship line. And uh, um, back in March, 2020, um, one of the important kind of milestones in my career was when uh, Governor Newsom introduced Friendship Line California um, uh, in a partnership we have with the State Department on Aging to increase the visibility uh, in uh, the 58 counties of California. And I was very, uh, you know, very happy to have him acknowledge the role of Friendship Line uh, you know, throughout not just the Bay Area, but throughout California. And at that time, in terms of numbers of callers, we had uh, between 1,000 to 2,000 calls per day. And as many of you know, our whole, and for many of you, your whole business model had to change as ours did too, because we couldn't have people at the Institute on Aging office. And so we had to do everything remotely, uh, which was quite a challenge, which was such an uptick in calls. Um, but I was just really grateful that Friendship Line has survived a whole lot of ups and downs uh, throughout um, the lifetime of Friendship Line, and we continue to serve people today. Uh, next slide. And in addition to, you know, receiving call-ins, uh, like many suicide prevention centers, uh, we also uh, provide outreach, and then we also, as an accredited um, crisis intervention hotline, warm line, uh, we also provide grief services, uh, which since the beginning of the pandemic has been moved to the Zoom format. And, uh, you know, if you know of, you know, older people or younger disabled individuals that are, you know, grieving, uh, we feel that that's a very important um, connection for people. And uh, if uh, we have these uh, Zoom meetings on Saturday mornings, we also have traumatic loss, eight week grief groups. And if anybody's interested, you can get a hold of me uh, if that is helpful. The reason I introduced this is because I think as a crisis intervention hotline warm line, uh, we're really concerned um, about, you know, older people falling through the cracks and, uh, you know, ageism is alive and well, along with sexism and racism, and homophobia. And uh, so. Uh, we have lived through some remarkably moving battles in the year past. Similar or different with the divine presence? Uh, I want to remind everyone if you are not speaking, if you could please make sure to mute yourself. Uh, can people hear? Sorry about that. I'm looking to find them to mute. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just, I, anyway, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, next slide. So um, I, that's why I was saying about Jocelyn introducing the stats from, um, you know, Riverside County. Um, these are data from 2019, according to the American Association of Suicidology. And uh, I'll just highlight the, um, you know, suicide rate for older adults uh, in 2019 was 17 per 100,000 population for those 65 and older or it was um, about 9,173 actual uh, numbers. Although those of us who work in suicide prevention um, see these as kind of low bound estimates um, uh, that we think that the numbers are actually higher. Um, and uh, as Jocelyn was saying too, that uh, the suicide rate for middle-aged individuals, 45 to 64, um, also has been uh, increasing since, uh, um, the Great Recession back in 2007, 2008. And uh, for those 45 to 64, um, their rate was 19.5 per 100,000 or about 16,000 in terms of actual numbers. Um, next slide. And I think as Jocelyn was also reporting uh, that there have been increases um, in suicide deaths uh, among some racial and ethnic uh, minority groups. And uh, I won't go into detail here, but you can just see 
that for um, uh, in 2019, for Hispanic individuals, it was seven, their rate was 7.2. Uh, for uh, non-white females in general, it was 3.4. Women tend to have a lower um, rate of death by suicide than men. And for non-white males, uh, their rate was 12.2 uh, per 100,000 population. Uh, next slide. You know, and in the national data, firearms for 2019 accounted for 23,941 suicide deaths, um, which was about 50.4% uh, of um, the causes of death by suicide. Uh, next uh, slide. And according to the uh, California Department of Public, Public Health, the overall suicide rate in California was 10.7 per 100,000 population in 2019. The highest county rate was in Lake County in 2019, which was uh, accounted for, well, its rate was 30.4 per 100,000. And the lowest rate was in Santa Clara County at 7.5 per 100,000 population. Suicide rates peak at multiple stages throughout the lifespan. You know, first among young adults, uh, 25 to 29, followed by middle age, and then highest uh, for those 85 and above. The highest suicide rate in 2019 was 45.1 per 100,000, uh, which was among those ages 85 and above in California. Suicide rates are highest among American Indian, Alaska Native uh, you know, um, uh, populations. Um, and what I wanted to just acknowledge here and um, and, and this is one of the many reasons I'm very honored to participate is that um, when it comes to aging and we see that, you know, for those 85 plus um, are the highest rates uh, of suicide death, uh, and those are mostly male. Um, and yet in terms of our actual understanding uh, based upon empirical evidence about who these individuals are, um, you know, we don't have a lot of, you know, empirical evidence about, you know, what are the issues, needs, concerns of those people 85 plus. Uh, they're often, they're often uh, not, you know, uh, subjects in research uh, that is being done. And uh, so we really need to also focus attention on that age group. And as you know, many of you know, the 85 plus age category is the fastest growing age category in America today, you know, followed by the second fastest growing age category, which is the 100 plus. So, you know, in terms of suicide prevention efforts, we really need to make sure we're connecting uh, with those individuals who are among the oldest old. Uh, next uh, slide. You know, and uh, acute suicide uh, and chronic suicide, for example, acute suicide that leads to death may be attributed to natural causes or accidental causes, thus leading to an underestimate of the frequency of suicide, as I was talking about a few minutes ago. More difficult, I think, for all of us, certainly uh, those who work on traditional suicide prevention um, crisis intervention lines or, you know, warm lines or friendship line. Um, you know, are these these chronic uh, suicide, um, you know, individuals, uh, people who are not eating, are failing to eat, you know, uh, people that are, uh, you know, are sustaining drug and alcohol abuse, uh, refusal to use life sustaining medications, self neglect, uh, certainly in your county, I'm sure the APS staff are really you know, very concerned about self-neglect among older people in um, communities in um, Riverside County. And uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on too about sustained drug and alcohol abuse is that, you know, when you look at the literature, what you find over and over again is this following comment that, you know, uh, when it comes to alcohol and substance misuse, uh, among older people, it's a hidden epidemic. And, uh, you know, and, and that has been, you know, for decades, I've been reading that this hidden epidemic of, you know, substance abuse among older adults. So, you know, 
we need to pay attention to that. We need to really look at uh, our outreach with older people, and we really need to have conversations, you know, about the use and misuse of substances um, and its relationship to depression and uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, next slide. We also want to remember that uh, a lot of our, you know, older population uh, live in places other than their homes or apartments. Uh, older adults who live in a nursing home or a hospital setting, assisted living, or personal care home might seem to be um, safe from suicide um, ideation attempts or deaths. You know, people in these settings will not usually have access to firearms, although that's not necessarily always true. And older adults can and do die by suicide in these places. And so I think that's another area that we really want to uh, make sure that we are, you know, connecting with in terms of mental health issues and or uh, issues related to suicidal thinking um, and to really, you know, uh, prepare staff in these organizations, um, you know, or these uh, settings, um, you know, for how to recognize, you know, people who might be at risk for severe depression and or for suicide uh, behavior. Uh, next slide. So we want to also just briefly, you know, I wanted to acknowledge some, a couple of theories that I think are important for us uh, in terms of, of a framework for understanding. And uh, Fisk and O'Reilly in uh, a um, uh, article that they wrote on developmental theory uh, is very applicable. Uh, Dr. Amy Fisk was my uh, assistant back in the early 70s um, when she was working for the telephone company. And wisely, uh, she went on to get her doctorate uh, and has been working in the field of aging and uh, suicide prevention at the uh, um, West Virginia State University. The lifespan developmental theory provides a suitable framework for understanding why suicidal thoughts and behavior may vary across, you know, uh, ages. As you were hearing Jocelyn talk about, you know, in terms of looking at the breakdown in terms of age uh, and gender, in terms of your data from Riverside County, this theory posits that late life suicidal ideation is linked to restrictions um, and adversities uh, associated with aging, you know, such as physical illness, cognitive impairment, interpersonal losses, and other age-related changes, whereby those who are unable to cope with and adapt to life's changes will be at greater risk for suicidal ideation. Uh, and what's important here, and you know, uh, again, in my work in the field of aging, and for those of you who work in this uh, with this population as well, you know, um, this pandemic has been really hard um, on older people. I think younger people as well, but I think it's been particularly hard for older people who live alone, uh, older people who are living alone not by choice, but because of death of a partner or spouse or a family member, and uh, and uh, and we don't quite know what's going to happen down the road. Um, when I looked at the literature about other disasters faced in other countries and also in our own, um, that it you know the data kind of look like people kind of hold on you know during the tragedy, um, but it's the prolonged nature of it uh, that starts to uh, wear people down. And uh, so I think we, I, I'm just so uh, glad, uh, Diana, that we're doing this today because I think this is a, a, a particularly important, you know, uh, time, uh, you know, for all of us, but I think particularly for older people. And it also has highlighted, uh, as I was saying, those individuals who uh, are living alone um, and or who are isolated. Uh, next slide. And I also wanted to acknowledge um, the um, interpersonal theory of suicide that was um, created by Dr. Thomas Joyner. Uh, Dr. Joyner's father uh, had died as a result of taking his life um, and which prompted Dr. Joyner, Thomas, his son, uh, to really explore this more. And uh, 
you know, and, and what I find very helpful about his theory of suicide is because when we look later uh, about the risk factors associated with older people and uh, suicide death, well, there's a lot of them, you know, and it's like, you know, how do we know which combination of risk factors uh, might be, you know, more acute than others? And, and what this um, theory does um, uh, was developed in an effort to determine more sensitive and more specific predictors of suicide risk and death. Uh, his father uh, had um, left his home one day in his van and uh, to a remote part of, I guess, the region in which he lived, and he had stabbed himself to death. And uh, he had left a suicide note that said, is this the only way, kind of question mark. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, Dr. Joyner's theory proposes that an at-risk individual must have both the desire for suicide and the ability to carry out the act. And uh, the desire for suicide uh, has to do with a thwarted sense of belongingness. And secondly, a feeling of perceived burdensomeness uh, on others. And what I find so valuable about this theory uh, is the, this idea of thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness. And if I had, you know, a quarter for every time I've heard an older person say, you know, I just feel like I don't belong anymore, or I'm such a burden on family and friends, because now, you know, I have to use this walker or I get tired so easily, you know, certainly during this, you know, holidays, I heard this many times, um, especially this particular Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday, uh, because there was a little bit more of a sense of, we can get together, you know, in smaller groups with family. And so many of my older clients with whom I talk on a regular basis uh, were saying, you know, it's just it's just too much of a burden for my daughter-in-law to pick me up and take me home. And I can't really, you know, I don't have the, you know, kind of stamina to safe, stay for the day. And, and I just think, but, you know, when people talk about not belonging and not and, and feeling like a burden, that should be a red flag. Uh, we really want to explore uh, what's behind that, what, what's motivating them to have that perception. Uh, Mindy, next slide. And so um, Marty and Associates um, also through a study that they were doing about the interpersonal theory of suicide found that it was well suited to, to describe late life suicide older people are more likely to experience shrinking social networks, which would be decreased belongingness and dependence on others due to functional decline, uh, increased burdensomeness. And um, so, you know, as you do more, um, you know, creating a structure in terms of your older adult uh, framework, I, I think this uh, theory uh, is, is very valuable. Uh, next slide. The other thing I think we must talk about has to do with ageism and ableism. You know, in recent decades, the study of ageism has increased, um, you know, um, has increased due to the growing elderly population. You know, ageism is quite different from other forms of prejudice because it represents bias and discrimination by members of one group against members of a second group, which the first group will one day join. And as I said, you know, ageism is alive and well. Um, it's one of the isms uh, that is most normalized in our society. You know, I teach for the Wright Institute and I was just reading a, a, the final paper uh, by one of my students and uh, he was, um, He's a master's student in, uh, you know, uh, for this MFT program. And his paper was so interesting because he said, you know, this was the first class. The class was on aging adult and long term care. And he said uh, that as a student who wants to be a therapist, he said this program that, that I conducted with them said, you know, he has so much unresolved issues 
<clears throat> about his own parents and how um, they were aging. The father has died as a result of alcoholism. Uh, the mother has moved uh, to her hometown where she's very isolated. And he said, you know, I, I have to look at my feelings about this. He said, I don't want to work with older people. And he said, I'm starting to realize that I have a prejudice against them. And I think it has something to do with my family. And, and I was just, uh, I, I really admired his willingness to, you know, expose that and try to acknowledge that he needs to work on uh, his feelings about older people. Uh, next slide. You know, and ableism uh, is, you know, even Dr. Robert Butler, who coined the term ageism, also included, you know, uh, disability in his definition of ageism. And ableism is defined as stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination, and social oppression toward people with disabilities, including physical, sensory, and intellectual disabilities, chronic health conditions, uh, psychiatric conditions, and others. Uh, next slide. So phrases such as, you know, 70 is the new 50 reflect a positive aging discourse, which suggests that the preferred way of being old is not to be old at all, but rather to maintain some image of middle age functionality and appearance. You know, I turned 74 at Christmas time and, uh, you know, I had, you know, people would send me you know, messages on email or text or uh, birthday cards. And so many of the birthday cards were saying, you know, like, um, I'll just ignore that age. And, uh, and again, going back to, you know, 74 is the new 54 or whatever, uh, 64, you know, and, and for those of you who are in your 50s, we are not competition for each other. I'm 74, I feel 74, and I'm grateful to be 74, you know, um, and, uh, but we've got to really look at all of our, uh, uh, you know, the way in which we look at older people. Uh, and I think we just have to be very thoughtful about it. 70 is not the new 50. Uh, next slide. And the lethality of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in later life contributes to the high rate of suicide among older adults as estimates from non-incarcerated populations suggest the ratio of attempted to completed suicide is four to one among older adults and 25 to one among younger adults. And I think that was implied in Jocelyn's uh, slides. Um, so we really, you know, when it comes to older people and suicide, um, we've got to act quickly. You know, we've got to be better able to identify uh, older people who might be at risk for suicide. And, um, you know, and again, if we hear them talking about I'm a burden or I don't feel like I belong, we've got to reach out to them. We've got to connect with them. I believe back in 1973 and even more strongly now is that connections with others uh, is what binds us to life. And, and you know, for the friendship line, that's everything we do is about connecting, you know, um, and about maintaining uh, connections uh, with uh, older people and younger disabled, you know, who are isolated, lonely, uh, bereaved, you know, anxious and anxiety, as you all know, uh, is one of the mental health issues that is plaguing uh, not only the older adult population, but younger population as well. Uh, Mindy, next slide. So we're, I'm not going to go into detail about these risk factors, but I think it's important that we identify them. You know, age, uh, as we said, older age um, is a risk factor, especially, as I said, in the 85 plus age category. And, and oddly enough, it's the age category um, that we know the least about, at least in terms of uh, empirical data. Psychiatric disorders are the most important risk factor, especially depression and alcohol abuse. And, and again, you know, the literature talks about the hidden epidemic of substance use uh, among older adults, 
we've got to we got to pay attention to that. You know, older adults with three or more prior depressive episodes uh, will be more likely to report suicidal ideation than those with two or fewer. Uh, next slide. You know, I already mentioned isolation, loneliness, um, or people that don't have a purpose, uh, don't feel they have anything meaningful to contribute. Uh, and, and we really need to pay attention to that uh, among older people. And, uh, you know, and, and I know it's very hard with the pandemic, but I think we've really got to, you know, um, connect with older people in our communities and, and create you know, um, you know, towns and cities uh, that really accommodate uh, older people. What we're seeing here, sadly, in San Francisco uh, Bay Area is older Asian men and women are being uh, attacked um, by younger people. Um, and, and one of the myths about why this is happening is that there is a myth that older Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders carry a lot of money in their wallets or purses because they don't believe in banks, which is absolutely ridiculous. But people believe this and they are being attacked. I don't know what it's like in, in uh, Riverside County, but it's really disgraceful uh, what's happening. And they target them because they're old and they believe that they carry a lot of cash. Um, you know, again, feeling a burden is a, another issue, disability or changes in ability not being able to uh, write any longer or hear, you know, especially hearing loss and vision loss uh, can be a risk factor uh, for suicidal thinking, pain of any type, poorer memory, thinking, feeling slow, trouble thinking through options uh, to make decisions. Uh, next slide. Physical illness uh, may contribute to suicide in over one third of older people. Illnesses, including central nervous system, especially Alzheimer's disease, um, cardiopulmonary conditions, um, those with mixed Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia may be particularly high risk for suicidal ideation. So, you know, there are just so many factors. And that's why I appreciate Thomas Joyner's uh, theory, because I think it helps us, you know, um, get a little closer to what might really trigger an acute suicidal reaction. Uh, next slide. Hopelessness, um, you know, uh, cycling of moods, coping styles, acting out versus expressing uh, stressful events, bereavement, divorce, medical illness. You know, certainly this pandemic uh, is a, a normal uh, or an enormous stressful event. The fires throughout California, um, you know, has been particularly hard on uh, older people, um, you know, who live in areas that are, you know, really under significant drought. Um, next slide. And so when we think about those, in those risk factors, uh, especially uh, factors such as uh, depression or anxiety, um, you know, uh, fears of Alzheimer's disease, that sort of, sort of thing. You know, well, disparities in mental health service use by race, uh, racial ethnic minority groups are, are very well documented. Um, so we also need to look at our mental health system and, you know, is it, you know, uh, dynamic enough to be able to, you know, reach out to older people regardless of their race or ethnicity, um, you know, to, to provide quality mental health care. In combination with the findings that racial ethnic minorities tend to receive less overall mental health care, less outpatient mental health care, and less likely to visit mental health specialists suggests that older racial ethnic minority adults may not be receiving needed mental health services. And that might also intersect uh, with cultural beliefs um, that some racial ethnic minority older people uh, might have, which is a distrust of uh, mental health and more reliance on, 
you know, home remedies or that kind of thing. You know, rates of treatment initiation and adequacy indicate that the majority of older people, regardless of race, ethnicity, are not receiving needed mental health care. What I'm experiencing here uh, is that, you know, um, many, many of our older clients are um, exhibiting, you know, a lot of stress, certainly related to anxiety, uh, this whole unpredictability, you know, is there another variant uh, after this Omicron variant? And how is that going to impact us? And, uh, and I have tried to connect um, many older people uh, who really need a psyche valve. Um, and it's been ridiculously um, challenging, you know, to get someone to call these individuals back. Uh, so who do they rely on? Uh, they rely on their primary care physician um, who may be very skilled, but might not be very skilled when it comes to mental health issues among older people. Um, and, and that's been very challenging. And, you know, and I would imagine it must be so uh, in Riverside as well. Uh, next slide. You know, population projections predict, predict that the number of older adults uh, with mental health il illness will climb in the next 20 years. You know, it's estimated by 2030, one in five older adults, over 15 million persons will have a mood, anxiety, or psychiatric disorder. The stigma of having a mental illness appears to be getting worse. Older adults are more likely than younger adults to experience mental illness as stigmatizing, uh, presenting an important barrier to accessing care. Um, and I, I, I just find um, the work by Jimenez and others to be really important for us to, you know, sit back and ask, you know, is our mental health system, you know, uh, strong enough to respond to the needs of, you know, uh, this growing number of older people who may be having a lot of mental health concerns. And uh, I know here, uh, I just don't feel like our mental health system is adequate uh, for this growing population. Um, and, and I think it's something to really consider uh, when we look at, you know, our, um, you know, the way in which we hold and help support older people uh, that might be suffering. Uh, many older people, I remember back in the early days of Friendship Line, uh, my volunteers or myself would be talking to an older person who would be actually listing off symptoms of depression, uh, clinical depression. And uh, when I would, you know, just gently try to acknowledge that, gee, it seems like you're talking about depression, and I just wonder what your perception of depression is. Uh, oftentimes they'd say, oh, you think I'm crazy, and, you know, I'm not crazy, and what's wrong with you? And uh, just the other day, I was talking to an older person um, on the friendship line, and, uh, and she, again, was describing the symptoms of clinical depression, and I said to her the same thing, you know, what is your perception about depression? And boom, she was just so angry that I had said that. So this stigma of mental illness, the lack of, you know, uh, support for older people when it comes to mental health issues um, is, is, you know, um, you know, profound. And, and we really need to look carefully at, you know, uh, training then for non, you know, or paraprofessionals, volunteers, you know, staff, as I said, at nursing homes or senior residences, because they're often in the front line and they, with training, could be better prepared to acknowledge that maybe this Mrs. Smith in room 20 uh, is suffering from depression. She's not just old, she has a clinical problem and we need to respond to that. Uh, next slide. You know, and, and most suicide intervention and prevention programs are based on known risk factors for Caucasians uh, due to their higher rate of suicide uh, in the past. And, and I appreciate it when Jocelyn was pointing that out. You know, um, however, researchers are now beginning to investigate potential risk factors that may be unique to other ethnic groups. 
because what we're we're seeing is that among this you know growing population of older people that you know older people who are african american or asian american or pacific islander um who are uh you know uh, hispanic you know um those numbers of older people are also growing and uh and we really we really need to look at you know um does one shoe fit all older people or do we really need to be much more specific about how we deliver our mental health services or our suicide uh prevention services uh to you know a diverse group of older people including uh caucasians uh research has also found an association between sexual orientation and suicidality you know suicidal thoughts and attempts are higher among gay and bisexual males than their heterosexual counterparts especially uh during adolescence but what we're also seeing is um that older people who identify uh as lgbt uh individuals may not be receiving mental health care because of fears um around being shamed if they acknowledge their sexual orientation and we know very little about older transgendered people and yet we're aware that those numbers are growing as well so you know there's a a lot of diversity uh among older people um you know these days uh next slide so we wanted to also um acknowledge um protective factors you know we spend a lot of time on risk factors um but we really need to also look at and identify protective factors so that when we're building you know support for uh older people uh that we we look at you know uh the strengths you know not just at the vulnerabilities you know um one of the things the data indicate when it comes to uh you know populations of older people that have the least highest rate of uh suicide death uh and that's among older african american women have the least highest rate of suicide of any older uh specific population and yet trying to find research articles on that pop on that population of people is is very limited um and and yet it's like we should be looking at that population we should be looking at women in general because women in general have the least highest rates of suicide compared to their male counterparts um and uh so i think we have to balance risk factors with protective factors and among those according to the cdc are you know coping coping and problem solving skills cultural and religious beliefs that discourage suicide connections to friends family etc supportive relationships with care providers availability of physical and mental health care limited access to lethal means among people at risk uh next slide you know um you know the key characteristics of resilience resilience is another protective factor you know um the key characteristics of high resilience among adults um uh and older adults highlighted in the literature include mental social uh and and physical factors you know and we have to be thoughtful about resilience and that we don't want it to move into you know an ableist kind of idea you know that you know healthy um uh, happy older people in their 80s and 90s um uh, you know are the you know uh um the prototype of you know healthy older adults um uh, no because younger people who have you know younger older people that have health problems you know what we want to help them learn is to be as healthy as they can even uh if they are dealing with some um you know uh health or mental health uh uh adversities uh research suggests that adaptive coping styles optimism hopefulness positive emotions social support and community involvement 
as well as activities of daily living, independence, being physic physically active may have particularly strong associations with high resilience and appear to be among the most frequently studied. But again, I, uh, my caveat is that we have to make sure that we look at people that may have older people that may be dealing with, you know, uh, disabilities, uh, whether it's sensory disabilities or, you know, uh, other physical problems that we want to acknowledge that those individuals have strengths too. And we want to make sure that they're part of the, of the conversation. Uh, next slide. Now, again, although the U.S. has made progress in raising awareness about mental health and normalizing conversations about the topic, a great deal of stigma remains around mental illness, as I was saying, and, uh, and poor mental health. And many still face barriers to accessing um, you know, services and supports. Um, and so we really you know, uh, need to pay attention to uh, stigma as it applies to older people in mental health. Uh, next slide. And it's important also to assess for social context in which the individual lives. Um, you know, uh, we want to look at neighborhoods, you know, uh, neighborhoods where older people can walk and, you know, get to know uh, neighbors, uh, you know, uh, where there are, uh, you know, grocery stores that sell, you know, quality produce. Uh, quality vegetables, quality uh, fruits. Um, and, and we know that a lot of older people slip into uh, situations where uh, it's kind of like a grocery, you know, uh, desert. Um, and, uh, and so we really need to look at communities in which older people live and do they support, you know, older people having a quality of life. Um, and I think that's very uh, important very important, you know, uh, next slide. And so other issues in assessment of older suicidal adults include distinguishing between normal idiosyncratic and diverse characteristics of aging and pathologic conditions. Uh, again, um, older people all don't suffer from depression, you know. Uh, depression doesn't really care about age. Um, but in an age of society, we have to be very thoughtful um, about our ability to assess for mental health issues in a in a you know a way that actually allows us to understand that is this older person you know dealing with depression or do we just forget about them because we say that's just what old age is about? Old age is about you know, you know, not having energy, not being, you know, uh, you know, able to do things anymore. And, and I think we, we've got to separate those two out. Not all older people are depressed and, uh, and depressed people can also be older. Uh, and we've got to be able to talk about that. You know, baseline data are often lacking from an individual's middle years. Uh, so that when we're doing an assessment, you know, we just see this, you know, 74 year old person or 82 year old person, and we don't recognize that they had a past, you know, um, because of our ageist uh, uh, attitudes, you know, standardized tools and functional assessment is meaningful if placed in the context of the person's past life and, you know, hopes and expectations of the future. You know, when we when we talk about the 85 plus age category is one of the, the fastest growing age categories in America today. Well, you know, um, you know, when I talk to my students and I'll say that, I'll say, and then the second fastest age category is 100 plus, And I'll say to them, you know, uh, I'm sure you have talked to your friends or family and said to them, you know, I want to live as long as possible. But when I tell you, statistically speaking, that is, you know, probable for many of you, uh, I don't hear you saying, Yahoo, I'm really excited about it. Uh, you look glum and gloomy. Uh, and I, I think again, that that again is a sense that to be old is probably the worst thing to be in America today. 
unless you're someone like Betty White, you know, or, you know, people that have really good insurance and have a lot of financial resources. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, um, I like the AIM model uh, because I think it provides um, some best suicide prevention practices to everyday clinical care, but I think it also just helps us um, in terms of our families or our neighbors or, you know, um, you know, older people who are in our caseloads. And, and again, it starts with some kind of, you know, we need to do some assessing, you know, we want to inquire explicitly about suicide ideation and behavior, uh, both past and present, you know, we want to inquire, have you ever, you know, uh, in your life thought about you know, uh, suicide. Have you ever attempted suicide at, uh, you know, at a, you know, a younger age? Uh, we want to assess to identify risk factors in addition to suicide ideation and behavior. And so this is where we want to think about um, uh, Dr. Joyner's, you know, uh, theory, which is, you know, uh, have you ever felt like you didn't belong? Do you feel like you don't belong now? Or do you ever feel like you're a burden? You know, I think that is, uh, you know, an important use of his theory. Implement and maintain continued focus on safety. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, older people are, are safe, you know, in their apartments or in their uh, homes, uh, that their neighborhoods are, are safe, that it's a a uh, place that is, you know, um, you know, uh, available for them to walk and to, you know, meet people. Uh, next slide. The second part of the AIM model is to intervene, you know, to introduce and develop a collaborative safety plan intervention for managing suicidality, including lethal means restriction. So we want to be able to acknowledge, you know, through assessment and now through intervention, is this person at an acute risk uh, of suicidal behavior? Um, and then we want to initiate coping strategies and support. Uh, and we want to initiate suicide specific treatment targets in treatment in the treatment planning uh, process. Uh, next slide. And then thirdly, the third part of the AIM model is monitoring. We want to be able to increase flexibility and contact availability. You know, so for example, you know, um, with Friendship Line, uh, we make outreach calls to individuals that, you know, um, may be, you know, dealing with uh, depression, who might be dealing with you know, uh, grief and loss. And I think during this pandemic, uh, there is a sense of collective sorrow uh, that, you know, many older and younger people are experiencing. Um, and, and we just want to make sure our communities have ways in which we can connect with older people and they can connect with us. You know, it's all well and good that we have Zoom, as we were talking about before this began uh, this morning with uh, uh, Diana and the others, is that, you know, it's really been so valuable as a resource that we can, you know, meet with our families and, and our clients uh, on the Zoom platform or FaceTime or, you know, other platforms. Um, but who gets, you know, um, who doesn't get that kind of opportunity are people who are older who do not have these technological skills. I had one of my clients said to me, uh, she said a kind person brought her over an iPad and she's only about, you know, uh, I think 75 or 76. And she said, uh, I said, oh, what did you think of that? And she said, well, it's sitting on the table where it's been sitting for several months. She said, what good is that to me? I don't even know what it is. Uh, she said, I opened it up. She said, I don't even know how to, try. I don't even know what to do with the damn thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was just, you know, one of, I'm sure, thousands of people or more older people that 
They don't, you know, they certainly need to have a laptop or an iPad or something. But as this lady was saying to me, she said, what I really needed with the iPad was someone who could teach me how to use it. That's what I really need. Um, and I've been conveying this to uh, the AARP um, uh, committee, California committee, uh, of which I am a volunteer with them about people who are isolated and lonely. Um, we can't assume that everybody has technical skills uh, and, and we've got to provide some other support for them. Um, so we want to involve family and other so social support and we want to invoke clinicians, peer support and consultation. We really need to work together uh, if we're going to be able to support and, um, and, and increase the quality of life for older people, whether we're in Riverside County or in any of the 57 other counties in California, so that people can have a quality of life as they get older. Uh, next slide. You know, and few standardized assessment tools included any older subjects, as I said, in the uh, development of the tool, especially the 85 plus. And then ironically, the 85 plus has one of the highest uh, rates of suicide among uh, you know, uh, age populations. Assessments should also include cultural issues, cognitive functioning, demoralization, depression, paranoia, substance abuse, uh, psychopathology, suicide risk, um, so we really want to um, examine carefully our assessment tools. Uh, next slide. And uh, what we also want to uh, look at are the effective evidence-based interventions that are available um, you know, to us. And this is data uh, gleaned from the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, and, uh, what, uh, according to their research, uh, brief interventions uh, can be very helpful. You know, um, so when it comes to safety planning, for example, personalized safety planning has been shown to help reduce suicidal thoughts and actions. Um, you know, patients work with a caregiver to develop a plan that describes ways to limit access to lethal means such as firearms, pills, poisons, you know, and as Jocelyn had referred to in your county, uh, that um, that older women who have uh, died uh, by suicide have used, um, you know, poisons or pills and alcohol, uh, that sort of thing, and uh, and and to work collaboratively uh, with older people um, and have that client, neighbor, family member, patient uh, be an active part of a safety plan. You know, uh, how many times have you heard or seen yourself uh, when your family member, older family member might be in the hospital or at the doctor's office and uh, you, the daughter or son or, you know, friend who is younger uh, go with uh, this older person and the doctor is talking to you about the person rather than including that older person in the conversation. Uh, that still goes on. Uh, and, and we need to think about, again, you know, ageist assumptions. Uh, why am I not, as a professional, speaking to the patient? You know, do I assume he or she has memory loss or cognitive impairment? You know, um, you know the plan also lists coping strategies and people and resources that can help in a crisis. Uh, next slide. You know, and uh, brief interventions also would include uh, follow-up phone calls. Research has shown that when at-risk patients receive further screening, a safety plan intervention, and a series of supportive phone calls, their risk of suicide goes down. So I think, you know, when it comes to evidence-based approaches, uh, you know, some of these like follow-up phone calls, uh, you know, again, Friendship Line does this, and uh, and I'm sure there are programs in Riverside where you can, you know, um, provide this kind of support, or you already have that. I think we're going to be talking about uh, your resources um, uh, later in the program. Um, uh, 
Uh, next slide. You know, so collaborative care, uh, there's a lot of evidence, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about a team-based approach to mental health care when it comes to older people. A behavioral health care ma manager can work with the individual themselves, their primary health care provider, and mental health specialists to develop a treatment plan. Um, so I, I just think that that's you know, such a, a, a good way of managing and supporting someone that has mental health issues as an older person. When, as I said earlier, the person, if they speak to at all about mental health, it's usually their primary care physician. Um, and, and we wanna expand that so that that primary health uh, provider also is working with a behavioral health care manager and a mental health specialist. Uh, and it would be really ideal to have someone who specializes in aging uh, be part of a team like that. Collaborative care has been shown to be an effective way to treat depression and reduce suicidal thoughts. That's what we want. We want to reduce that kind of, you know, uh, uh, depressive thinking. Uh, next slide. And primary care-based depression screening uh, is something that the National Institute of Mental Health is, uh, has found some uh, good data around this. These interventions featured this collaborative care model in which depression care managers worked with primary care physicians to monitor symptoms, uh, administer treatment, and otherwise support the doctors in terms of their uh, connection with that older person who may be depressed. Uh, the NIMH goes on to say that of all the included interventions um, that they were looking at when they did a literature search, the primary care-based screening and depression management programs were most effective. Um, and, and, you know, that's really powerful, uh, you know, that that if we have someone who can be like in the role of depression care manager uh, and also collaborating with the individual themselves as well as their primary care physician, you know, uh, when, when I see things that says, you know, these are effective, we really need to uh, look at them further. Uh, next slide. And then many of you are aware of, you know, the gatekeeper program um, and the NIMH is still very supportive of that, training gatekeepers and paraprofessionals, you know, that this had a sig significant effect on suicide prevention among older adults, um, you know, and I think, you know, I certainly have seen this in my work with Friendship Line uh, right now, uh, Dr. Carla Parasonato, uh, who is a geriatrician at UCSF and a researcher, um, is um, doing some uh, very interesting research uh, in terms of studying the friendship line and friendship, sign, friendship line's impact on lonely, isolated uh, seniors. And the preliminary data uh, look very, uh, you know, look really powerful. And uh, so I'm very excited, you know, I've only been after this for what, 47 years to try to get this to happen. What it says that if you persevere long enough and you're passionate enough about your program, sometimes things happen uh, and that you've been waiting for for decades. You know, um, gatekeepers uh, training can be a way that volunteers can assist healthcare professionals such as nurses, physicians, social workers, psychologists. Gatekeepers can teach specific groups of people to identify suicidal adults and then refer them for treatment. Um, and this, this really goes back to an old model, I think began in Seattle, Washington or Spokane, Washington with the first kind of gatekeeper study. And, uh, and it's still a uh, valuable tool in the you know, fight against um, suicidal uh, behavior. Um, next slide. You know, um, Another uh, program that can be um, you know, put together has to do with designing educational programs for the community. And uh, I'm sure they, you know, your 
suicide uh, prevention coalition probably does things like this. Uh, and then my concern is making sure that the design is targeted to older people as well. You know, um, suicide prevention needs to reach into communities and cultures. It's important to address the negative attitudes related to ageism and develop educational strategies that can reduce discrimination of and prejudice towards older people in general and uh, suicidal older adults in particular. And uh, I, I also um, want to acknowledge Jocelyn for you know stating that you know most suicide prevention monies. Uh, go towards youth and young adult suicide prevention uh, programs. And, uh, you know, and, and we really need to extend that to uh, the older adult population as well to strengthen uh, what we can do in support of them. And uh, uh, next slide. And then, you know, there's the peer-based prevention strategy, which is providing peer companionship to reduce loneliness and behavioral therapy to increase social engagement in order to enhance social communication in senior centers and senior living communities. We know with, um, unfortunately with uh, senior centers uh, due to the pandemic and the restrictions, um, you know, that's really been a loss for a lot of older people that found, you know, um, you know, very positive connections and maybe a hot meal or two and activities and educational programs and exercise uh, opportunities uh, at uh, senior centers. And, um, you know, so I really uh, recognize the importance of that, um, you know, and other kinds of, you know, settings. Um, you know, we at, I think I mentioned that at uh, Friendship Line, we have, you um, trained grief facilitator volunteers who support our, um, our grief uh, groups uh, through the Zoom platform. And those are very popular. Uh, next slide. And then, you know, crisis intervention telephone lines, although the state of the science regarding the effectiveness of crisis response services remains limited, overall results prove supportive for such services. We know, you know, anecdotally that programs, you know, I'm sure your suicide prevention, um, you know, uh, crisis lines or the warm lines uh, in Riverside, and we certainly see this up here too, is that we know anecdotally that people are helped. They make that clear, um, but it's getting the, you know, empirical data that has been challenging. And, uh, but, what we do see is that uh, the data uh, reveal that, you know, um, you know, crisis intervention, telephones, hotlines, warm lines uh, play a role in supporting older people in the community uh, stay connected. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of you are familiar uh, with the um, RAND Corporation. Uh, some of you might remember the, that a number of years ago, the state uh, through Cal Mesa, uh, provided funding uh, for uh, expansion of suicide prevention centers uh, in terms of their ability to um, receive more calls. Uh, they also supported uh, programs, uh, crisis line programs to be accredited uh, by the American Association of Suicidology. And they did uh, some work too, uh, looking at those programs. And so um, in their uh, RAND Health Quarterly of 2017, uh, the researchers uh, looked at preferences for help for suicidal thoughts, you know, and, uh, and in terms of the percentage of respondents and that we see, you know, seeking help face-to-face -face from a mental health professional uh, was high on the list um, that, and I hear that from my older clients, as I said, they want to, they want to, you know, see somebody. Um, and it's been incredibly challenging because of COVID. You know, uh, seek help face-to-face -face from fam family or friends is also very high in terms of uh, request. And what that speaks to is what I was talking about is that we really need to educate, 
you know, family members, community members, you know, potential gatekeepers um, about suicide and older adults. And, uh, you know, so that they will have a, you know, a foundation to be able to respond appropriately and effectively to an older family member. You know, visit a website for information, uh, call a crisis line for advice and resources, 62% of those respondents, um, et cetera. Uh, so I think that the RAND Corporation has a lot of data that can also be very helpful for us as we plan to support our older clients. Uh, next slide. So <laughs> management and intervention. Uh, management consists of intervention strategies that are directed at preventing future suicide attempts. You know, an intervention can consist of two phases, crisis intervention and then treatment of underlying problems. And we must be prepared to uh, assist uh, family and other professionals when a suicide death occurs. Uh, next slide. You know, and uh, I think many of you are probably aware with the crisis intervention model, just because of time, uh, I'm gonna ask Mindy to uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, with this, it's, uh, you know, we must aggressively address the problems that may have exacerbated the crisis. Um, and certainly what I'm seeing is this, you know, ongoing struggle with the pandemic, uh, with this living with this uncertainty and lack of predictability, um, being alone way too long. For example, I live alone. My, um, you know, my dining room is now my office and, uh, you know, and I found it hard, you know, uh, to be, you know, uh, you know, in my home uh, day after day after day after day. I thought we were having a reprieve towards the end of 2021 and uh, and then the Omicron uh, variant hit. And so now Institute on Aging has us working from home again in the case of chronic or terminal illnesses, the professional uh, attempt, attempts to help the person adapt and adjust. And again, that's really, it's, we really got to help family members and, you know, others who have contact with older people to, you know, provide support so that we can adapt, we can adjust uh, to changing circumstances. Next slide. Uh, one strategy is based on the traditional telephone crisis intervention model that we mentioned. Um, you know, uh, primary prevention includes educating professionals and the general public, as I was saying. Uh, next slide. Community-based programs can provide information and teach skills to recognize and respond to risk factors that can lead older people to consider suicide. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I do, you know, um, you know, as uh, Diana was saying in terms of my, you know, bio, is that I've been doing this for decades, uh, you know, both here in California, but across the country. And, uh, and, and I just think it's so important that we talk about older people. We talk about older people and uh, the challenges they face. We talk about older people and their, you know, um, strengths uh, and, and, and remind people that, that all of us are gonna get old at some time. And uh, we want to get old and also have a quality of life. Uh, next slide. You know, so practical measures include helping people find a viable answer, you know, to, uh, you know, whatever problem it is that they're dealing with, you know, have alternatives, uh, you know, again, collaborate with older people, just try to reduce their suffering, uh, just a noticeable difference, offer transfusions of hope, uh, increase options, you know, um, play for time, meaning, you know, try to find ways to keep engaging with that older person um, so that they feel connected. You know, I uh, think it's important to, um, when you're talking about older people, and I think I have this in my reference list, but the, uh, the book Together by Dr. Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, is so powerful. And also, Ageless Soul by Dr. Thomas More um, that has a spiritual 
um, bent on growing older, I think can be very helpful um, resources. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, uh, blocking the exit, you know, uh, has to do with, you know, making sure that older people do not have access to firearms. Uh, listen to the cry for help, involve others, uh, you know, invoke positive patterns of successful coping, but be careful about ageist attitudes and assumptions and ableist attitudes and assumptions. Uh, next slide. You know, and then if the person is in an acute crisis state, we have to, uh, you know, uh, take more extreme actions. Uh, next slide. So what are some of the implications for uh, professionals? Uh, you know, older people have high rates of suicide. We know that. Knowing risk factors will help identify older people who may be at risk. Inquire about vague suicidal, suicidal thoughts, wishes to die, past attempts, be able to engage both the identified client and family. Uh, intervention is prevention. We can do things uh, uh, in support of that older person. Next slide. Uh, we want to encourage any of us, but including professionals, uh, you know, physicians, nurses, you know, uh, you know, people in social services to examine their own views of euthanasia and assisted suicide. They must also examine their own ageism in order to avoid the trap of thinking it's understandable that they would wanna die under those circumstances, for example. Be aware of the risk of suicide and one's own attitude about suicide. We know that suicide has a uh, suicide death has a stigma attached to that. Um, and, uh, and we want to be you know, very thoughtful about where we stand. You know, um, but we also must take care of ourselves and get the support that we need. Uh, if you are working with, you know, um, a caseload of older people that are very depressed or very anxious, or, you know, people that are thinking about suicide death, you wanna make sure that you are also receiving the support you need so that you don't uh, burn out or suffer from compassion fatigue. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, we want to be also very thoughtful about what happens, um, you know, uh, when someone does die as a result of suicide. And, uh, and this is really important in terms of, you know, tertiary prevention. We've got to really look at what is available, um, you know, uh, for us in our communities. And uh, what, you know, uh, we have done, and I know there are, you know, hospice programs that have, you know, um, grief support groups. Um, you know, we know suicide prevention centers often have, you know, suicide uh, bereavement support groups. Uh, Friendship Line, you know, uh, for years we did suicide bereavement support groups. Um, and what I noticed over time uh, was that uh, people would be calling me saying, well, I've had a traumatic death. It was homicide. My, my son or daughter or husband was uh, shot and killed, uh, sometimes collateral damage. And, uh, you know, and that I, I needed some, I, I want to be in a group. Um, and uh, a traditional grief group didn't seem to um, kind of work for me. So why can't I be in your group? And so, um, you know, I, you know, kind of thoughtfully um, thought about, you know, uh, this. And so we decided to try it. So we have, you know, our now on Zoom, our uh, grief groups uh, are referred to as traumatic loss grief groups. One group is for people who really would like to be with uh, people that have lost loved ones to suicide and they don't wanna be in a mixed group. So one group we have reserved for people who really wanna be in that group. And interestingly enough, um, they might be in that, drop into that group for you know several weeks. And then they'll say, because our groups are drop-in, 
they wanted to try a different group. And then they were in a group where there were be maybe uh, another person that might have death by suicide that they're grieving, but they would also um, um, have people who have had other types of traumatic losses and that they felt more comfortable in there. So, um, you know, I think it just depends. Do you have, you know, do we have enough sorts of support uh, for people as they deal with traumatic loss, sudden death, whether it's death by suicide or homicide or other kinds of um, losses. You know, um, the number of survivors of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, research by Cyril, uh, and this was uh, data from 2019, suggests for each death by suicide, 135 people uh, are uh, affected. The number of survivors of suicide loss in the US is more than 5. million, which is one out of every 60 Americans in 2019. And this, this number grows by more than 285,000 in 2019. As many as 40 to 50% of the population have been exposed to suicide death in their lifetime. And I, I wanted to acknowledge um, those of you who are uh, part of this uh, meeting today, uh, those of you that have lost a loved one, a family member, um, you know, a loved one, a friend, um, a classmate, uh, those of you who have lost a, a neighbor that, you know, uh, has uh, died by uh, death by suicide, um, you know, I just want to empathize with you because I'm sure as I'm saying this, you're probably feeling some energy in your heart chakra, uh, regardless of how long uh, that death occurred. I was talking to one of my clients yesterday, and she is uh, a 70 year old whose uh, son um, died uh, by suicide death seven years ago. And uh, it was his anniversary of his death. And, uh, and she was, you know, uh, really uh, just so stressed. And, uh, and she was just sobbing as she talked to me um, about the anniversary of his death. And she said, but Patrick, you know, here I am. And she said, normally, you know, I, I'm dealing well. She said, I'm in a group for uh, older parents who have lost adult children to death by suicide. And she said, I find that group very helpful. I went through your eight week traumatic loss grief group. I found that very helpful. I have resources. Um, you know, I, I have places that I can go. And she said, I do really, really well. But she said, today, I just feel so depressed, so down, so, you know, just in this dark place. And, you know, and I, reminded her because she said, you know, she said, I thought after a year, I should be better. Um, and she said, I'm not. And, and, and I think we have to look at the, the long range effect of death by suicide or other kind of traumatic losses um, and clear up some mythology. Some people, as we know, do respond, you know, um, you know, um, you know, I would say rather quickly to death, that they are able to, you know, manage that uh, um, pretty well. Uh, but not everybody does. And, and I think that's the thing that we've got to think about how to support people that are still grieving these losses many years down the road. I often have people who will say to me, you know, my father died 30 years ago, and and I never grieved his death. And now I'm at the age at which he died, which is 64 or 74, whatever it might be. And now I'm filled with grief about it. Where do I go? You know, and, uh, and I say, well, you can join us. Um, it's okay. You know, um, you know, we really need to think about it. it's an, you know, the group of survivors of traumatic loss, um, are often a hidden population. Um, and, and we need to open that up. Uh, next slide. You know, grief uh, turns out to be a place none of us know until we reach it. 
you know, um, how we can know ahead of the fact, the unending absence that follows the void, the very opposite of meaning, the relentless succession of moments during which we will confront the experience of meaningless, uh, meaninglessness itself. And this is from the book, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion that I would imagine some of you have read about the sudden death of her husband. And, and what I found, you know, over my, you know, uh, 48 years of um, doing this work is that missing, you know, missing the person, you know, um, you know, is, is so unending, you know, the absence that follows uh, this, you know, experience, the void, uh, the very opposite of meaning is so profound. And we know that uh, older people who have lost a spouse, even if the death was not, you know, a, a, a sudden or traumatic loss, uh, can trigger suicidal thinking uh, in older uh, in older people. So we want to be very thoughtful about that, um, and to support people uh, who are in this you know, again, lifestyle of missing. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely important. And I think it's a way to reduce suicide risk in this often, you know, unseen population of grievers. Uh, next slide. And, uh, you know, bereavement and its care are particularly relevant to older adults because they experience bereavement at a much higher rate than younger adults. One study found that over 70% of older people experience bereavement in a two and a half year period. Um, so it's the accumulation of loss that can be very destabilizing uh, with older people. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure some of you know this very well with older family members or older clients. Um, um, you know, I talk to people often who will say, you know, even in a, you know, um, six month or a year timeline that they may have lost, you know, five or six significant people uh, to, the, to them. Uh, one woman said, she said it was bad enough when my husband had a heart attack and died. And then my sister uh, uh, developed cancer and it was very aggressive and she died three months after he died. And then my best friend, one woman said to me, she said, I was talking to my best friend who lives in a different state. And she said, during the call, uh, her friend, you know, dropped the phone and she's, you know, trying to say, what's the matter? What's the matter? Uh, her friend had a sudden uh, bursting of an aneurysm uh, and died while she was talking to the same woman on the phone. So in this short period of time, she lost you know, a huge part of her support system, you know, uh, that is traumatic, you know, uh, and uh, deserves our attention. You know, spousal loss is very common, but deaths of friends or non-spousal relatives, especially siblings, may account for the greatest proportion of losses among uh, older adults. Uh, next slide. Loss of loved ones is associated with worsening health, including uh, weight gain or loss, increased rates of illness. Uh, a study assessed cardiovascular and immune functioning at two weeks uh, uh, after the death, six months post-loss in bereaved relatives of patients who died in the ICU. We know, and certainly during this time of COVID, many older people did die in ICU and didn't have access to family because of COVID restrictions. And I worry about that population of people um, because uh, there are studies that indicate exactly what I was saying there. Uh, the authors found changes in blood pressure, heart rate, sleep, neuroendocrine, uh, and immune functioning. Most of these changes normalized by six months post loss. However, uh, and that's, that's good, but many people have a really hard time uh, recovering from that. Uh, uh, I only have a couple of minutes. Could you do the next slide, Mindy? Uh, bereavement is associated with changes in social and emotional factors in older people, 
including a decrease in satisfaction and well-being and an increase in loneliness and social isolation. And so we really want to uh, think about that. And uh, next slide. Uh, and then, you know, we want to think about complicated grief. Uh, we need to assess for that in people that may be uh, really, really having a, a very difficult time. Uh, we know complicated grief is uh, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, and next slide. Uh, you know, and, you know, supporting people bereaved by suicide is a key objective of many international suicide prevention strategies. And uh, this has grown and is now known to have an increased for people that we know that this population, I'm sorry, has an increased risk of suicide, depression, and psychiatric admission compared with people uh, bereaved to other uh, causes of death. Um, and uh, I think we're going to stop here, Mindy, because uh, uh, I want to stick to the timetable. So it's, uh, I think, around 1037. I want to make sure we have enough time for the other parts of the program. So um, we'll end it here. And I just appreciate uh, your um, you know, ability to pay attention to what's uh, what I'm saying. I know this was a lot of content, and uh, but I think it will be helpful to have the slides uh, for down the road. Uh, thank you very much, um, Diana. Thank you, Dr. Arbor. Fabulous. I think you might have one more slide only. Oh, oh, oh. If you just go ahead and finish. That's fine. Yeah, right? yeah let's go to that uh, last slide, Mindy. Um, where that uh, quote right here, let me read this. Uh, Connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Connections are what bind us to life. Uh, oh, good. So that's a, a good place to uh, land. Uh, thanks. Thank you. I'm going to turn it to Rebecca that's going to talk a little bit about our local resources and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Diana, and thank you so much, Dr. Arbor, for providing such a wonderful pr uh, presentation for us today. Um, so to help us kind of move along in our learning, uh, we are going to share some information on programs and resources that we have available here in Riverside County uh, to support our older adults. So we do have our wellness and recovery for mature adults. This is offered through the older adult system of care uh, under the uh, RUHS Behavioral Health Department. Um, it provides services to mature adults ages uh, beginning at age 59 and a half. Uh, services focus on wellness, recovery, and resiliency, which are offered under three comprehensive programs. The first is the uh, full service partnership, which offers assessments and treatments focused on consumers' recovery goals, which include assistance around basic needs, uh, provide medication services, evaluate placement needs, and consult with primary physicians, and even link to health and other mental health specialty services. Peer and family support services are also available. Um, there is also uh, the specialty multidisciplinary aggressive response teams, which provide outreach and engagement to the at-risk population for homelessness, institutionalism, institutionalization, and abuse, who under you know, norm, uh, normal circumstances uh, would not receive services. There is also uh, the wellness and recovery program, again, serving mature adults uh, 59 years and up, um, and also transitional age adults with mature needs. Uh, so these are individuals who have a severe and persistent mental illness, and this is uh, clinic-based supports, which include psychiatric care, uh, which is also uh, uh, providing medication monitoring and physical health screenings. There's monthly case management and monitoring available, and then access to standard mature adult clinic services. Uh, we also uh, offer, let's see, uh, supports through prevention and early intervention. So the older adult system of care employs mental health liaisons, which are located at the Office on Aging, 
uh, and they provide consultation and education, which includes uh, the uh, CBT for late life depression. Um, and these are for clients with recent onset of depressive systems, um, symptoms including uh, support with community outreach and direct service. Um, there is also the program to enhance active rewarding lives, which is PEARLS for short. This is an eight session program uh, that includes skill building intervention to uh, decrease depressive symptoms often provided in the client's home. Um, it is an evidence-based practice with regular monitoring of the client progress. Um, services are time limited um, and usually geared towards seniors who are generally stable, but you know, have had some recent challenges or setbacks. Then there's also Care Pathways, uh, which is a 12-week support and educational group um, offered through the Office on Aging. And this is for those who are caring for older adults. Um, so let's see, the older adult system of care does offer uh, several satellite locations around the county, uh, which are included on this slide here for you. You know, through all of the comprehensive services that are provided under the older adult system of care, um, we have seen some really great outcomes. Um, this past year, uh, they saw a 39% decrease in hospitalizations, 17% decrease in mental health emergency department visits, it's almost 87% decrease in mental, um, excuse me, physical health emergencies, 92% um, 90, uh, decrease in arrests, um, and even 56% uh, uh, increase in language to primary care physicians. So lots of great uh, outcomes have, uh, we have seen through all of the services and uh, supports that have been offered. Um, I know there's, we're limited on time here, so uh, we do have um, contact information for you. So if you would like to know more about the older adult system of care and the programming that they provide, uh, please reach out to Tony Ortigo. His information is listed here on the slide, and, and he uh, would be happy to share more about programs and services. Next, we have Department of Public Social Services. So our DPSS department does have a few programs to serve older adults, specifically our Adult Protective Services, which helps to investigate and intervene in possible cases of, of abuse against older and or dependent adults. This is inclusive of physical, emotional, and financial abuse. Uh, they also offer in-home supportive services, uh, which is uh, providing in-home care for older adults that would meet certain qualifications. Um, those qualifications are listed here on the slide for you, but if you are interested in either of these programs, uh, contact information is listed here on the slide for you. And, um, I believe that these uh, slides are going to be made, be made available to you after today's presentation. So then we move to the Riverside County Office on Aging. So uh, the Office on Aging offers multiple case management programs that are focused on the client's physical and mental health and a range of services designed to encourage disabled and older adults to be socially engaged um, connected and uh, feel supported. So our uh, first program under Office on Aging is we have the Family Caregiver Support Program. Um, this is a program really designed to combat isolation and establish uh, connectedness for those families that are caring for an older adult. So this is accomplished through education and resources uh, given to family caregivers. Counseling refers, referrals are also available, and then all services are free. So um, OOA, Office on Aging, offers you know, information on local support groups as well uh, for older adults that are diagnosed or living with medical conditions. So more information can be accessed by calling the, uh, the number on this slide. If you have any questions about any of the programs or services offered, through Office on Aging, please feel free to uh, contact them through the number that we've offered on this slide. 
Um, specifically, though, if you have questions on our Family Caregiver Support Program, you can email Mary Harugo. She, uh, uh, I believe, is uh, supervising that program, and, and we will share her contact information in the chat as well. And then we move into looking at our 38 senior centers and community focal points. Um, so uh, our Office on Aging does have a comprehensive list of uh, the different senior centers that are uh, here in our county and that are available to pro uh, provide activities and support to our local seniors. We've highlighted a few here. Um, one in particular in the city of Temecula is offering a program called Staying in Touch. It's a weekly check-in to provide emotional support and comfort. Um, so if you want information on that, the number is available to you. In the city of Corona, a uh, senior center there in, in the city is offering another program called the Assurance Line. And again, it's a weekly call that's uh, just checking in with folks and, and helping to provide emotional support and resources if needed. Information on how to access that program, we do have a number for you that's listed. Um, and then we have the Mazelle Senior Center in Palm Springs. Uh, they are offering uh, support, um, caregiver support groups, um, and even support for individuals who have lost um, a partner. Um, some classes have moved online, so they are suggesting that you contact them first. And so the information is all there on our slide for you. And then finally, we have uh, some general here uh, resources that you can uh, share and uh, access. So we have the emotional helpline um, and the emotional helpline is uh, it's a 24 hour, seven days a week mental health helpline staffed by trained professionals. Uh, they are able to provide resources um, for our specific area um, and they can even support individuals uh, regarding certain or recent traumatic ex uh, events or experiences, um, even including you know, what we're dealing with with COVID-19. Uh, so we do have some, uh, some support there. Uh, let's see, Senior Center Without Walls is another really great program. It's a virtual community that offers phone and online activities that can help uh, build community through group conversations. They do game, play games um, and offer education. So in, our seniors can call in and uh, participate in the programming that they're offering. Um, we also have the Friendship Line, which is a nationwide resource, but it's one that was uh, shared briefly by Dr. Arbor, uh, but the Friendship Line is, is basically a warm line for seniors who are maybe feeling isolated or lacking that social uh, connectivity and would like to reach out and talk to someone. Uh, the Friendship Line is available to them. And then finally, we do have our uh, NAMI uh, organization, so that's National Alliance for uh, on mental illness. Um, they have a location here in our Western Riverside. Uh, so if you would like to call them or check out their website, that is listed on the slide and uh, you can find an array of services that they offer for, uh, for families, um, for older adults uh, who may need some additional support. So although this is not a a uh, comprehensive list of resources. It's just a few that we were able to curate for you to give you an idea of what's available. Um, so please take uh, time to take a look at these and, and to utilize any of these resources you think would be helpful. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Diana now. Thank you, Rebecca, for that. Um, for those of you that are eligible for continuing education, you need to complete the survey in order to get that. You will see that I left the, the information in the chat. Uh, we'll also follow up with an email today that includes the recording, the slides, and that survey link once again. So I want to offer an opportunity for any questions you might have for Dr. Arbor or um, I, any of us with the Suicide Prevention Coalition. So you can add your questions into the chat and I will screen them for Dr. Arbor or you can um, raise your hand or unmute and go ahead and ask your questions verbally. So as you're considering that, um, 
when we wait for anyone who might have questions, I wanna just let you know about our Suicide Prevention Coalition. And we are always looking for new membership. So if you're interested in being a part of a subcommittee um, and helping us to identify prevention strategies for older adults, we would love to have you. Just email us um, either at pei at ruhealth.org or you can email Rebecca or I directly to get that information. Okay, Maria has a question, please, Maria. Hi, thank you, Diana. Uh, I just wanna thank Dr. Patrick uh, for the information. You know, I, I care for my parents and I go to the to their appointments and, and help them. And um, you just hit a chord uh, at a big reminder, you know, because when they're talking, they're talking to me the, rather than talking to them. And I had made a, a new resolution for this year and making an effort and having them take over their um, independence of talking for themselves and just being a supportive. So I just want to thank you. Uh, great, great um, information. Thank you, Diana, for bringing him over and, and doing this presentation. It, it, it was a great, I mean, no words to express how, how much I, I, I took from this presentation. Thank you again. Thanks, Maria. Other questions? Dr. Arbor spent some time talking about the importance of addressing um, those bereaved by suicide loss. And our Suicide Prevention Coalition Postvention Subcommittee is working on that, um, trying to find survivors who are ready and in a position to become peer support facilitators. We wanna increase our groups and individual supports available to those that are bereaved by suicide loss. If you're interested in helping us identify that and work with us, we'd love to have you join our postvention subcommittee. It meets the last Monday of every month at 10 a.m. And we also have five other subcommittees. Normally we hear share out from each of them uh, in our quarterly meetings, but today we wanted to reserve as much time as we could for this important presentation. So included in the email that we'll follow up with will be a one um, a summary of the current progress of each of our subcommittees. So for those of you who are new to us, you can find that information, check out what we're working on. Um, and if, it, if that's something you'd like to be a part of, we'd love to have you. And we'll make sure you have all of our contact information as well. I'll continue to fill the time until there are questions that come up. I just wanna give everyone an opportunity to either add it in the chat, or raise your hand on mute and ask any questions. We have the privilege of having Dr. Arbor for the next six minutes. We wanna take full advantage of his expertise and ask him any questions that you might have regarding today's presentation. I get a quick question. How, how would you get in contact for one of the bereavement groups? So currently there are two, there's healing conversations through American Foundation of Suicide Prevention in Riverside County, as well as uh, one survivors of suicide loss here in our county down in um, the Temecula Marietta area. I have that information. I can send that out to the group as well. And because we have so, so few, that is why it is one of the primary objectives of postvention to increase those supports in our county. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Lisa has a question. Dr. Arbor, I'm wondering what your recommendations and interventions are for those older adults, particularly affected by the pandemic socially, especially for those who are not tech savvy. Could you elaborate on what practical activities that have been effective to increase social connection for the most isolated seniors in our community? Yeah, I think that, uh, thank you, Lisa. I think that's a, a really timely and important question. And I think probably a lot of your programs in Riverside, uh, just like what we've been doing up here with the Friendship Line and other programs, is to come up with you know, creative ways to stay in touch. Um, and not the least of which is the old fashioned telephone. Um, as I was implying earlier, a lot of the clients with whom I work on the Friendship Line are people that um, are on limited income. Um, and, uh, but what most people have uh, is the telephone. And so uh, we do a lot of outreach. And I think it's particularly important when I think Diana or Rebecca, you were talking about 
uh, that program that makes outreach calls once a week, or I, I forget the name of it. Um, but I think, you know, that kind of established program um, is so important for a lot of our older people who really just have lost friends and family. You know, I say to older people all the time, you know, tell me something about your social network. And they'll say, I don't know what happened. Friends and family have just disappeared. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, and, and so that I think reaching out by uh, phone uh, is very important. Uh, if people are more technologically savvy, um, and I think that's where uh, one of your, Rebecca, that you were talking about, Senior Center Without Walls, uh, which I really strongly support, and I've given a lot of talks over the years, uh, you know, with them, and, uh, and I think that's a very valuable resource. I think it's also important in Riverside County, uh, as you're doing, uh, Rebecca, is pulling together these resources um, that have strong outreach capacity. Um, and I think strengthening that is really uh, helpful as well. And, you know, um, and then investigating what is available, not just in the county, but in the state or, you know, across the country where older people could uh, participate. So I think, uh, you know, there's some unique issues in terms of trying to find the right program to fit the needs of that older individual, but I, I, but I think there are opportunities, you know, as well as friendship line, as Rebecca was commenting on as a resource. Awesome. We have a couple more questions. Um, Stacy's asking: Is there any data on suicides of older relatives who live in other states when we can't get information from live? Um, I, I, we might need some clarification from Stacy on that question. Stacy, if you want to unmute, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're asking? Hello. <laughs> I was just wondering because um, I had a grandparent um, commit suicide in a different state, and he had just been visiting with us, but um, there was really no way of us knowing what was happening um, with him. He lived in Oklahoma and really let loneliness factor and that fear of being a burden thing, I think, was what happened, but we really didn't know it. I feel like we didn't ask the right questions. Well, I certainly want to just acknowledge the loss, and I also appreciate just your, um, you know, your wanting to inquire about, you know, what, what were the circumstances surrounding his death. If you know the town in which he lived or the county, uh, you could contact the um, coroner's office of that county because the medical examiner would be the one who would determine cause of death. And I think as a family member, I think you could, um, you know, set up um, an appointment, you know, even a phone appointment um, with one of their, you know, um, one of the coroners um, for that county in which he uh, died. And that would be, I think, a first step. And I would encourage you, if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to, to do that um, because that might be a way that you can um, learn more about how uh, the circumstances of his death. And I would add, Stacy, that here in Riverside County, we offer suicide prevention gatekeeper trainings to understand the signs, symptoms, and how to begin the conversation with someone that you might be concerned about. So we can make sure that you have that information as well if you or anyone um, in your family wants to be trained in that information. All right, thank you. Thanks, I'm aware of the time, it is 11 a.m. There is one more question in the chat. Um, can, we, can we borrow you for a couple more minutes, Dr. Arbor? Sure. Awesome, and for those of you who can say, please do so. If you not, we'll follow up with an email and thank you all so much for being here today. Um, Dakota is asking what has been done or can be done to create a place for mature adults to contribute, considering the feeling of being a perceived burden is so pernicious. Well, I, I think as Rebecca was outlining some of the programs you already have, I think those are, you know, are really um, important to use. I, I really strongly support senior centers. Um, I know there's a big debate now over the name Senior Center uh, nationwide. I happen to like the name Senior Center. Uh, I'm less attracted to the movement to call them 
community centers, and then there may be a room or a conference room for seniors. I, I really don't like that. You know, I, I like intergenerational, but I still like the idea of actually acknowledging our communities a senior center. We have a place where seniors are welcome, you know, uh, and I, I like that. Um, and then I think, you know, to investigate, you know, uh, there's so much happening on Zoom. I think Senior Center Without Walls is another really good one. Uh, we use them up here as well. So I think there are uh, a number of programs. And uh, as Rebecca was saying, that in your county, uh, she's given you a lot of numbers that you can investigate. But also, if you're thinking about other uh, counties, um, I think they, their local office on aging would have resources such as the ones I'm describing. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Arbor, for being with us today and sharing this terrific presentation. You're getting lots of thank yous and great information, wonderful insight. Appreciate you being here so much. Thank you to all of our community members who joined us today. Those of you interested in being uh, having a greater role in our Suicide Prevention Coalition, please email us at pei at ruhealth.org to get connected. And we hope to see you at our next suicide, our quarterly meeting on April 27th at 9 a.m. Thank you all so much. And have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.